you can return to your seats. And while they do that, I'll ask the congregation to please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Which can be found on page 786 of your pew Bibles, if you would like to follow along. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 13 through 20. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can, it be, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, it, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Creator and from Jesus, the Son of God who is our Savior. Amen. Now, when I was in college, there was a woman that I really, really wanted to ask out on a date. This was, by the way, years before I met Lori. (laughs) I was very nervous about this. You know, kind of that anxiety when you're contemplating doing something like that, and I was in my dorm room with a couple of friends, and I was going back and forth with them on whether or not I should actually make the phone call. Finally, I just said, well, hey, what's the worst that can happen, right? I mean, she'd say no. That's the worst that can happen. Yeah, said my friend Jim. That's the worst that can happen. She would say no. And so I picked up the phone and dialed her number. And then Jim went on. Or, she could say no, and then she could laugh at you. What? Huh? And then he said, and then I suppose she could tell all of her friends, and they could laugh at you too. That would be worse. Pause. Panic. And then I heard her voice on the phone. Hello? Click. There have been times in my life when my own uncertainty in my ability, my hesitancy to take risks, and my frustrations with how hard something might be have completely shut down my willingness to do what needed to be done. And I've let moments and opportunities pass me by. Anyone else do this ever? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, I thought so. Well, at least, okay, in this case, it all worked out for the best, so. But our gospel lesson for today speaks into the hesitancy, our hesitancy, and our lack of confidence in our own sense of identity. And we are not the only ones who experience this. In the early 1900s in England, King George VI was unexpectedly thrust into the monarchy when his brother abdicated the throne. The new king felt wholly unprepared for his role. King George suffered from a significant stutter, which made it almost impossible for him to speak publicly, which is, of course, an important task for a king. This story was made famous in the movie The King's Speech. A great movie, by the way. Well, at one point in the film version of the story, when meeting with his speech coach, Lionel Logue, The king is intensely frustrated when he shouts out, I just can't do it. I can't change. I can't become something 
that I'm not. Well, Lionel, now kind of equally frustrated with the king, replies, you don't have to do anything. You are the king. You just need to talk like one. Well, Lionel Logue correctly reframes the king's struggle. It's not a crisis in ability that he experiences. It's a crisis in identity and confidence. How often in my life could I, or probably could any of us, benefit from hearing advice like this? In our gospel for today, Jesus tells us that you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, it's important to note here that Jesus isn't ordering his disciples to go be light or to go and be salt. No, Jesus is saying, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. This is a huge distinction. It is the difference between a command and a promise. Jesus is saying that his disciples, you, are already the salt of the earth and the light of the world. It is a present tense statement, not future tense. In the world in which we live, we tend to blow by the significance of these simple statements. But in the Middle East, in the days of Jesus, these were significant images. Remember, there was no refrigeration. Salt was used not only to flavor foods that could be pretty bland, but would also preserve food, especially meat, until it could be eaten. And in a world that relied on fires, torches, and oil lamps, after dark, for Jesus to say that his disciples were to be light in the darkness carried huge meaning to those who heard them. Jesus is saying in our gospel that this is our identity as children of God, salt that gives flavor and preserves, and light that defeats darkness. The problem isn't that we're not equipped to be salt or light. The problem is that we lack the confidence to step boldly into our role and to speak out, to be the hands and feet of God, the salt and the light to a world that desperately needs it. We are not in a crisis of ability. We are in a crisis of confidence, confidence in our identity and in the promises of God. Now, we all struggle with this. Indeed, The whole of the Christian church throughout the world struggles with this. This is a difficult time to be the church. It just is. We have, I think, a confidence problem, a boldness problem, and this is showing up in in several different ways. Universally, worship attendance is down and, and financial support for the work of the church is down. I saw a statistic, a statistic that said that in 1990, in our own denomination, the ELCA, there were over one million children enrolled in Sunday school. And just 20 years later, in 2010, that number was right around 480,000. The church is aging. The average age of people who are a part of faith communities is going up. And according to the Pew Research Center, the fastest growing religious group in the country are the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. The nuns are those individuals who on the U.S. Census form select none for religious affiliation. In 2015, the nuns made up 23% of the U.S. population. Interestingly, the Gallup organization's most recent polls indicate that 89% of Americans believe in God. So these nuns, it's not that they don't have faith in God, it's that they don't have faith in the church. And I can't say that I completely blame them. 
When the Christian church has made it into the news in recent years, it's often been for all the wrong reasons. We fight amongst ourselves. Our leaders put their foots in their mouths, and scandal and sometimes cover-ups have created problems that can be hard to recover from. The reality is the world has changed, but much of the church is still operating like it did in the 1950s and 1960s when Christianity held a place of privilege in our society. Well, of course no one would schedule anything on a Wednesday night. That was church night. And Sunday mornings, they were, they were sacrosanct. The church sat in the center of American culture and the world of the church benefited and we built these beautiful sanctuaries and people would just walk into our doors. But the world isn't that way anymore. And now the church struggles trying to find its identity its confidence. And you know what? I think, I think that's okay. As a matter of fact, I think it might even, in the long run, be good. Good for us, good for the world, good for God's mission. I believe it might be good because I think it will return the church to a mission state of mind. We can no longer just stand around and count people as they come in the door. We need also to go out to show and live the love of God, to invite, to welcome. We need to remember and to be confident that we are salt and light for the world. In the first century, after Jesus' death and resurrection, the church was lean. It was small groups meeting in people's homes. They faced they faced persecution. They had no money, no sanctuaries, nothing like that. But they had passion and a mission. And in my experience, people who have passion and who have a mission, mixed in with a healthy dose of the Holy Spirit, simply cannot be stopped. I believe God is calling the Christian church today to return to its first century roots. God is calling us to reach out and to serve those in need, to invite the neighbor, to care for the poor, the widow, the refugee, the sick, and the infirm. God is calling us to be salt and light to a world in need. And make no mistake, the world is deeply in need. In this gospel passage, Jesus is making promises and giving out gifts. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. This is sheer blessing. And it is about identity, about our very being, which in turn leads to doing. So here is your homework for today. Look deeply into your lives over the last couple of weeks and think of the variety of ways that God has used you to be salt and light. Your words of encouragement to others, your faithful work at your school or, or your place of employment, the volunteering that you've done, the prayers that you've offered, or the promises that you've, that you've made and kept. Yes, any of these things may seem... <clears throat> in and of themselves, small. But please don't forget, small is what God most often uses to change the world. Today, Jesus tells you that you are salt and light. Don't stress about being who you are not. Just be who you are, salt and light. Salt that brings flavor to the world and preserves. Light that drives away darkness. And you've got, right now, all the tools that you need to be these things. Trust in this. And the church, the church has, right now, all of the tools that we need to be these things. Trust in this. Once you begin to believe that you are salt and light, that together we are salt and light, confident in who God has called you to be, your light shines. It shines so that people will see your good works and give thanksgiving and glory to your Father in heaven. 
and God's mission is fulfilled, and the world changes into what God created it to be. Thanks be to God.